Hello and welcome to this series of meditations for Good Friday. These reflections have been prepared and presented by different churches in the Westbury area. My name is Rebecca Harris and I'm the team rector for the Whitehorse team ministry and rector of All Saints Church in the centre of Westbury. We have loosely based our reflections on a book called A Cross in the Heart of God, Reflections on the Death of Jesus by the Reverend Dr. Sam Wells. A different church has led each one on a different theme from the book. We're starting today with a theme of finished, which seems like rather an odd way to start. Each reflection will include a reading from the Bible, a meditation and a prayer. As this is the first one, we shall begin with a hymn to set the scene on this Good Friday. Come and see, come and see, come and see the King of Love. See the purple robe and crown of thorns he wears. Soldiers mock, rulers sneer as he lifts the cruel cross. Lone and friendless now He climbs towards the hill We worship at your feet Where wrath and mercy meet And the guilty world is washed By love's pure stream For as he was made sin, oh help me take it in. Deep wounds of love cry out, Father forgive. Worship at your feet Where wrath 
born to earth to restore us to your heaven. Here we bow in awe beneath your searching eyes. From your tears comes our joy. From your death our life shall spring. By your resurrection power we shall rise We worship at your feet Where wrath and mercy meet And the guilty world is washed by love The reading is from John, chapter 19, verse 28 to 30, the death of Jesus. Jesus knew that by now everything had been completed, and in order to make the scripture come true, he said, I am thirsty. A bowl was there full of cheap wine. So a sponge was soaked in the wine, put on a stalk of whiskey, and lifted up to his lips. Jesus drank the wine and said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Finished. It is finished. These were Jesus' last words on the cross. I wonder how you feel when something is finished. It depends what it is. I know the feeling of having finished something. Achievement. We might feel proud of what we are sweated and agonised over and which has taken a considerable experience and perhaps even our health and our relationships. I remember when I left my last role and for me there was a sense of achievement felt called to do and things were certainly different when I left from when I had arrived. However, some people felt differently. Some people were shocked and saddened when we made the announcement that we were leaving. They wondered how they were going to manage and it left a hole which they weren't sure how they were going to fill. It left a lot of uncertainty about the future and lots of questions about how they were going to move forward and where God was leading them to next. When Jesus uttered these words, it is finished, it was actually one Greek word meaning it stands finished. We might say, that's it, it's over, the end, I am done. It expressed a sense of completion, that his life's work was over, the mission which his father called him to was completed, and there was nothing more he could do. He had given his all, he had made the ultimate sacrifice for God and for the world. There was nothing more he could give of himself. No one could ask any more of him than this. People were shocked and turned away and gone into hiding. All apart from his mother Mary, Jesus was left alone on the cross, naked, battered, bloodied and bruised after his torture by the road that anyone could have suffered at the time. The most humiliating treatment left for the worst criminal. As we reflect on these things, I'd like to share some images of cultures have approached and depicted Jesus' death. 
Jesus meant and still means different things to different people in different times and cultures. We don't always appreciate this. Jesus' horrifying death on the cross means many different things. But the one thing they all have in common is that Jesus died on that cross. His life was finished. And whatever image or role we want or expect from Jesus also finished at that time. So here we have our first image. This is a picture by Margaret Tarrant from the UK called Lesser Brethren. It's the sort of image of Jesus which we might interpret as gentle Jesus, meek and mild. It's a popular image of Jesus known throughout the Anglican world. It's clearly based in the English countryside, as you can see. With the animals, rabbits, squirrels, deer, a badger, all around him. And it's a lovely image, one which some people might have had over their beds in the past. It is a rather sentimental image of Jesus, which we might be keen to cling on to. One which is very far from the image we have of Jesus on Good Friday. It's almost like we've gone straight to the image of a resurrected Jesus while bypassing the cruelty and horror of the cross. But you can't do that. The only way the resurrection has any meaning is through the cross. You have to go through Good Friday in order to appreciate the wonder, the glory and the power of Easter Day. Here we have a very different image of Jesus. This one comes from the Philippines. We can see real anger in his face, his eyes and his mouth and his pointing finger. The artist captures and reflects the anger of the people in the Philippines whose lives are manipulated by forces outside their control. It shows Jesus who is angry with an unfair, unequal world in direct contrast to the previous image. In Jesus' time, many people, including Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus, believed that Jesus was going to be their conqueror, that he was going to rescue them from the cruel oppression by the Romans. From the Gospels, we read that Judas got so frustrated with Jesus that his ministry wasn't turning out the way he was hoping it would that he betrayed him to the authorities. This image of Jesus as a conquering hero come to rescue an oppressed people was finished, gone with Jesus' death on the cross. This image comes from Latin America. It illustrates the political nature of Jesus' ministry and crucifixion and is a major theme in liberation theology. He is depicted as a dangerous criminal, wanted by the powerful in society for upsetting the local people. The Roman authorities saw him as a stirrer, a rabble riser, and for that he had to die. Many people today think of Jesus as the kind of person who wants people to obey the law, who is meek and considerate and doesn't want to rock the boat or disturb the neighbours. They can't stand the idea of Jesus getting mixed up in politics. This is the Jesus who was put to death as a common criminal, whose ministry is finished on that day on Calvary. Here we have another striking image of Jesus, the tortured Christ from Brazil. It's a shocking image of Jesus' tortured body on the cross. It represents for the artist, the agonizing suffering of many people around the world who suffer at the hands of oppressive regimes. For the artist, here was Jesus 
who, while enduring the fiercest torments on the cross, remained fully human. His life and death were part of his message and his mission, as he made remain true to this right to the end. Many people like to think that Jesus is on their side, on the side of the poor and the oppressed, someone who has suffered with them and knows what it's like. Jesus' death therefore completes this aspect of his ministry. There is nothing more he can do. It is finished. And finally, we have this image. Perhaps you might have seen this before, the Spanish crucifixion by Diego Velasquez. It represents a rather more sanitized image of Jesus on the cross. Yes, there are the nails in his hands and feet and the place where the sword pierced his side. But he is wearing a loincloth and despite the crown of thorns on his head, it looks like there's a halo around his head. So it seems to depict a more divine image of Jesus, where he appears somewhat more relaxed, if that's possible, and resolved, which actually seems to me more in line with the image of Jesus presented in John's Gospel, where Jesus' death is part of his glory. Jesus' humiliation, agony, and the horror of it seem to have been set to one side, and we're called to focus on the glory of the cross and invited to wonder, what does this mean for me? At the end of our exploration of these images of Christ, what are we left with? Perhaps we get an impression of the vulnerability and fragility of Jesus. Despite being the son of God, he didn't use his power to take control. He didn't escape or run away. He didn't flinch from the pain, the agony or humiliation of it all. From John's Gospel account, he became a passive victim. He surrendered to the trial and punishment. And he did it all out of love for God, love for humanity, love for the world. Let us pray. So as we ponder on the reality and significance of the cross today, on the deep and enduring love of God shown to us in Jesus Christ. Faithful God, in your crucified son, we see that you are never finished with us. Empty our hearts of all but love that we may respond with mercy in the face of injustice and may find our home beside those on whom the world turns its back. In Christ your Son. Amen. Our Bible reading is from St Matthew chapter 27 verses 1 to 10. May the Lord bless his word to us as we hear it. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him to Pilate the governor. When Judas, his betrayer, saw that he was condemned, he repented and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned in betraying innocent blood. They said, What is that to us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver in the temple, he departed. And he went and hanged himself. But the chief priests, taking the pieces of silver, said, It is not lawful to put them into the treasury 
since they are blood money. So they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Therefore, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him on whom a price had been set by some of the sons of Israel, and they gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord had directed me. Here ends the Bible reading. What do we know about Judas Iscariot? In Matthew chapter 26, verses 14 and 15, we read, Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and asked, What are you willing to give me if I deliver Jesus to you? So they counted out for him 30 pieces of silver. Clearly, Judas was greedy. We read in chapter 12 of John that Judas objected to the expensive oil being poured onto Jesus' feet by Mary. He said it was a waste of money, which could have been used to help the poor. He was a hypocrite and clearly wasn't interested in helping the poor at all. He was keen to line his own pockets. In verse 6 of Matthew 26, it states that Judas was the keeper of the money belt and that he was a thief who stole from it. So we can add thief to the list. This isn't painting a very good picture of Judas as a man. The Bible tells us that Jesus knew that Judas was going to betray him and yet he kept him in the group of 12 that he had chosen. At the Passover meal, he told his disciples that Judas was going to betray him, and Jesus told Judas to do it quickly. If Judas, if Jesus kept Judas in the group, despite knowing his flaws, then this is how we too need to treat those that we know who are flawed. We are all sinners and by God's grace are being changed to become more like Jesus. It's a lifelong journey. We need to pray for, encourage and help those who we know are getting things wrong and not to cast them away from us. Jesus loved all of his disciples and we need to be doing the same. Now let us look at today's reading in a little more detail. We see Jesus, uh, sorry, we see Judas was seized with remorse. He didn't want the money that he'd earned from betraying Jesus, so returned the 30 pieces of silver. He said to the chief priests that he had sinned, and then he hung himself. Over the years, I've heard versions of good riddance to bad rubbish said about Judas. I wonder if you agree with this. I think the whole ending is tragic. Judas didn't know Jesus or God very well if he figured he had to kill himself because he'd sinned. We know that Simon Peter also failed Jesus in his last hours. He had denied Jesus three times, and yet he didn't kill himself because of his remorse. He knew that Jesus would be able to find a solution for his actions. Jesus knew Judas would betray him. Peter would deny him three times, and all the disciples would desert him. They were still allowed their free will and to make their own decisions. I wonder how Jesus felt 
knowing his nearest and dearest would fail him. It's clear Jesus didn't love them any less as a result of that fallibility. Of course, we now know that Jesus hung on the cross to take away the sins of the whole world. That included the sin that Judas committed when he sold Jesus to those in authority and betrayed him with a kiss. It also included Judas's thievery, his greed, his hypocrisy, and any other sins that he had committed. Judas spent three years with Jesus. He saw him healing the sick, feeding the 5,000, raising the dead, walking on water, teaching and preaching. How sad that despite this, he clearly didn't understand that Jesus came to save the lost, the sinner, and those that society had rejected. Jesus came to save Judas, yet he didn't understand and took his own life. Do we really understand at a deep, deep level how Jesus wants to save everyone, not just the good and easy to live with? It's easy to judge Judas and to feel pleased that we are better than him. Can we honestly say we've never stolen? Have we never taken a personal call during work from a partner, a friend, or somebody that is not work-related? If we've done that, we're stealing the time that our employers pay us to be at work. The same goes with searching the internet for something that we want to know that is not work-related. Perhaps you've put some mail through the franking machine. That too is stealing. Taking it out of a work context, maybe when a letter has arrived at home with a stamp that wasn't franked, you've peeled it off, stuck it on another letter and popped it back with your letter into the post box. It's still stealing. And finally, this is an example that I have done so many times and I had to repent frequently. I buy a three pound ticket from Waitrose Car Park, use an hour, find somebody, give them the ticket, and pass it on to them so they don't have to pay 50p. Well, yes, technically it was my three hours, I'd paid for it, but if I'd been the ticket, that other driver would have had to pay 50p and buy their own. So I was actually stealing from the council by trying to be generous. I think you get my point. I've sadly met many people who don't believe that Jesus will forgive them for their sins. If Judas hadn't killed himself, do you think Jesus would have forgiven Judas? We already know the answer is yes, because Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. Jesus forgave the thief, the murderer, who was hanging beside him on the next door cross and said to him that today he would be with him in paradise. We need to believe and know for certain that Jesus took our sins on the cross. No matter what we've done wrong, once we repent, we are forgiven. If Judas had repented of his sins, Jesus would have forgiven him, and he could have lived a reformed life. How sad that he chose to kill himself in despair. It is also sad that Judas chose not to forgive himself. The Bible tells us in Luke 22, verse 3, that Satan entered into Judas, and we know Satan is the accuser. Not only would Satan have been whispering words of accusation about Jesus to ensure that Judas betrayed him, but he would have made sure Judas felt condemned for his actions. Today, let us learn from Judas to really get to know Jesus as our Saviour and Lord. Let us learn to understand his love for us, to carry this knowledge of forgiveness and love 
through our daily lives. Let us walk with our heads held high, knowing Jesus died for all of our sins and that we are forgiven forever. We also need to remember to forgive ourselves when we mess up. If Jesus forgives us, we need to forgive ourselves too. We can then look forward with confidence to it joining Jesus when our time comes in paradise. May God bless you. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, our Heavenly Father, who to redeem the world delivered up your only son to be betrayed by one of his disciples and sold to his enemies. Take from us, we ask you, all covetousness, all hypocrisy, and so strengthen us that having you above all things, we may remain steadfast in our faith to the end through him who gave his life for us. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 Almighty God, we beseech you graciously to behold this your family, for which the Lord Jesus Christ was contented to be betrayed and given up into the hands of wicked men and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, ever one God, world without end. Amen. 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 Lord, we thank you for all that we can learn as a result of Judas's time on earth. We thank you that you have died, that whatever our sins, you can take them away. There is nothing too big that you cannot forgive when we are truly repentant. Lord, today we pray that you will again forgive us any sins we have forgotten, that you will remind us that we too need to forgive ourselves. And we pray, Lord, for a fresh inpouring of your Holy Spirit so that we may become more Christ-like. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Welcome to part three of this Good Friday meditation. My name is Reverend Caroline Husband. The focus for this meditation is pierced. As we look at the photo picture there, we can see that the spears are entering into Jesus. He is being pierced. And today we will be thinking about how Jesus was pierced and perhaps about our own pierced moments as well. So take a moment to still yourselves. Breathe deeply. Be aware of your breath as it fills your lungs. Then breathe out all that air slowly. And do this a couple more times and then let your breath return to a more natural state. Through this meditation, you might like to gaze upon the picture or you may want to close your eyes once you have seen enough. The invitation is to hear these words and to talk to God about them or if something else bubbles up to talk about that in the quietness of your heart with God. Take this time for you and allow God to minister to you. Since it was the day of preparation and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day. The Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true and he knows that he is telling the truth so that you may also believe. 
For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And then another scripture says, they will look upon him whom they have pierced. And so we too look upon the one whom has been pierced. Jesus, the long-awaited Messiah, is dead. It looks like it's all over before the revolution had really got started. Or was it? In the Jewish tradition, I think it's true to say that Sabbath is the highlight of the week. It's a time to set aside all our agendas and to take delight in being alive. Following the example that God set before us, resting on the seventh day, enjoying all creation. The Jewish people understood just how much we need the Sabbath and how the Sabbath was created for us so that we might reconnect with ourselves, that we might reconnect with each other and that we might reconnect with all creation. It helps us to remember that the world will carry on doing what the world does without us having to do a single thing to help it. For we are not God. Only God is God. And the Sabbath helps us to remember that. You could imagine that if you had a family day after having a busy week at work, that you do not really want to go around on a nice lovely walk and see dead bodies hanging on crosses as you take your stroll around the village or the borders. The Jews in this story are no different. They do not want to see all this death and the reminder that our bodies are frail and will give out when the time comes. And it's often said that when you see a dead person, you know they are dead. And yet there are stories of people who seem to come back to life even when all hope is completely gone. And the people in this story do not want any possibility that Jesus may still be living. They want the story of this rebel, this heretic, to be over. He was a threat to the status quo. He was a threat to their comfortable ways of dealing with life and dealing with the Romans. They did not want him resurfacing. And so they went to the Roman leader, Pilate, to ask that the legs might be broken to hasten death so that they could be taken down from the crosses before Sabbath begins. Soldiers came, they broke legs, but when they reached Jesus, they realised he was already dead. They didn't break his legs. Instead, they proved it by inserting the spear into the side of Christ. Blood and water came out. And to those of us who are unfamiliar with what happens to blood when we die, we perhaps do not know the significance of this. Jesus had already been dead for some time, but the blood had separated. Blood and water. The person who told the story declares that this is the truth. Jesus died. He was dead. And it, so therefore it was safe to remove his body from the cross. He would not be going anywhere of his own accord. Blood and water, a very powerful image. An image that perhaps makes connections with other stories that you might know about Jesus. Water, baptism, and the proclamation that this is my son, my beloved son. Water, purity, purity making us clean, washing away dirt and grime, washing away the wrongdoing and giving us a fresh start. Water, the source of life provided for us, part of God's great provision that we cannot create for ourselves. Water as rain, growing crops, turned into food for our most basic needs. 
water turned into wine, a cause for celebration. And blood. Blood is usually messy. A little goes a long way. You may remember once, a long time ago, scraping your knee and the mess it made, the way it hurt. We associate blood with pain and trauma and with the messiness of life. We remember stories that were told, the parable of the Samaritan, the woman who had bled for years and despite everyone's best efforts, was still bleeding. We tend to recoil from the sight of blood. It scares us. It reminds us that life is fragile and that blood spills out. And we see Christ with blood and water spilling out, combining hope and promise with pain and despair. We remember our own fragility, our own vulnerability before God. And before we try to hide behind excuses and justification that ultimately sound lame even to ourselves, we gaze upon Christ. We remember our own pain and suffering, the times when we have been pierced, by words and actions that have wronged us, that have hurt us, that have wounded us. Perhaps we still carry the scars. And we remember them and we accept them. And if we can, we think about those things as part of what keeps us being human. We think about those things in ways that help us to know, help us to think about the way we treat others. We didn't enjoy that woundedness, the piercing, and we don't want to do that to others, to hurt them. We acknowledge God's presence with us. And if we let him, healing us from memories and past hurts. And as different memories bubble to the surface, we welcome them. They are as they are. Let us not judge them or accuse them. We do not want to try and hide from them. They are part of what makes us, us. And then let us let them go. We release them, saying to God, I let go of my desire for security, for affection and control. I let go of my desire for survival and security. I let go of my desire to change other people or the situation or the condition and even myself. And I open myself to the love and presence of God and God's action within me. As you spend time gazing upon this picture, you may find that there are things that bubble up. And if it would help, please can I urge you to come and speak to one of the clergy team. If you're part of a church, please speak to your minister. And I'd also encourage you to to do something active but to dwell in the moment, to remember those things and perhaps turn to some form of art or craft and to talk to God whilst you're doing that and allow God to minister to you.
perhaps you can just give those things to him. And allow God to heal you from within. God continues to love and to cherish each of us. His desire is for each of us to know love, to know joy, and to experience life in all its fullness. And this is his wish for each of us. And in order to receive that gift from him, we need to come to him and to talk about those things that concern us, those things that worry us, that pierce us. And to share our grief with him and then allow God to share himself with us. Amen. Luke. Chapter 23. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified Jesus with the criminals, one on his right, one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. They cast lots to divide his clothing, and the people stood by watching. But the leaders scoffed at him, saying, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him. This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there kept deriding him and saying, are you not the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation, and we are indeed have been condemned justly? For we are getting what we deserve for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said, Jesus, remember me today when you come into your kingdom. Jesus replied, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Amen. And some of you may know that during the pandemic, I am spending several days a week working as a hospital chaplain, principally with COVID patients. What you may not know was that my first chaplaincy was a good few years ago in Bristol when I was based at the prison, which was then a Category A jail, holding some of the most dangerous criminals. What used to shock me every time I went inside that prison was just how young most of them were, often little more than their early 20s. I can't help but wonder how young the criminals who were crucified to the side of Christ were. I wonder what led one to turn to Jesus. And Jesus, amidst all the agony and the pain and the suffering, showed such compassion to that man. A meditation which picks up these themes based on what might have gone through the mind of the mother of that criminal. I read from Nick Fawcett's Book of Meditations, No Ordinary Man. My son said, 
remember me when you come into your kingdom. Remember the poor wretch who suffered and died beside you. What name? Him asking. I really don't know. But there was something about that man, Jesus, which clearly touched him. Enough, apparently, despite the agony he endured, to inspire that last desperate plea. It came as a, as a complete surprise, that's for sure, that he wasn't a religious person. His faith, not just in God, but in everything, long broken by then. You see, he knew he'd done wrong. He wanted to change, to put the past behind him and start again. But what hope did he have? For how many were there ready to give him a second chance, willing to believe he could mend his ways? Well, I'll tell you, none at all. One mistake, one moment's madness, and he was an outcast, a reject, condemned to spend the rest of his life in the gutter, devoid of hope, devoid of meaning. No wonder he just couldn't take it. Eventually, he just snapped, throwing not just scruples, but caution to the wind. And after that, there could be only one result. It broke my heart when they caught him. For he was still my son, whatever he'd done. Yet he seemed resigned by them. As if he accepted that he deserved punishment for his crime. But as they lifted up his cross, he caught sight of Jesus, nailed there beside him. And my son's expression changed in a moment from dull despair to anger, disbelief, dismay. And I knew what he was thinking because I felt it as well. Why this man, a man who was so clearly innocent? Not an ounce of evil in him. Not even the suggestion of hatred or malice. He took everything. The crowds threw at him the insults, the ridicule, the rejection. And even when the other fellow hanging there beside him joined in the abuse, hurling down curses, his reaction never changed. No anger, no resentment, no curses in return. It was the first time I'd ever seen anything like it. The only time. And clearly it touched my soul as much as it touched me. But the next thing I knew, I heard his voice calling out loud and clear. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I caught my breath. Afraid of what might happen next. But why should Jesus listen there of all places? What reason to think he'd have time for anything but his own agony? But he loved with a look I will never forget. Such love, such joy, such acceptance in his face. And he spoke those wonderful words. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Is it true? Well, I can't tell you, can I? Well, not in this life anyway. But if you want proof, you are going to have to wait and see. But I can tell you this. When they cut my boy down, I held him in my arms. And you should have seen the smile on his face. The peace and the joy it radiated from him. Happiness which I'd given up hoping ever to see again. That was enough for me. I knew that. Beyond doubt, beyond question, that Jesus had heard his prayer and answered him. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, whoever we are, whatever we have done, 
It is never too late to respond to your love. You are always ready to forgive and forget, always waiting to pick up the pieces of our lives and help us start again. That's why you came, to offer a clean break to everyone who recognizes their need. A new beginning in this life and the life to come. And that is why we come to you now, seeking your help and your mercy. For we know our weakness and our sin is ever before us. Lord Jesus Christ, we join in the words of that simple and unforgettable prayer when you come into your kingdom. Remember me. Amen. The Bible reading is John chapter 21, beginning at verse 24. It is the story of Jesus after his resurrection and his encounter with one of his disciples, Thomas. One of the twelve disciples, Thomas, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord, Thomas said to them. Unless I see the scars of the nails in his hands and put my finger on those scars and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, the disciples were together again indoors and Thomas was with them. The doors were locked. But Jesus came and stood amongst them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and look at my hands and then stretch out your hand and put it in my side. Stop your doubting and believe. And Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Do you believe because you've seen me? How happy, how blessed are those who believe without seeing me. There was a story of a, a young boy. And this young boy had a, uh, like many of us, had friends. And these friends would come and play with him. But his father noticed that the boy's friends stopped coming. He spoke to his son and said, Is this because you are ashamed of your mother and the scars that she bears on her hands? And the boy shuffled uncomfortably and had to admit that this is why he didn't invite his fat friends around to his house anymore. And the father explained to him, the scars on your mother's hands were caused because you fell into the fire and she had to rescue you from that when you were a baby. Nothing more was said, but the father began to see the boy's friends returning. And one day he overheard the son say, my mother's scars are a sign of her love for me. Many years ago, before Jesus was born, a great prophet wrote, he had no beauty or dignity to make us look at him, nothing attractive to draw us to him. We despised him, we rejected him. He endured pain and suffering and we ignored him as if he was nothing. But he endured suffering that should have been our suffering. It is the pain that we should have borne. I thought he was punished by God, 
because of some sin that he had done. But he is wounded because of my evil. He is beaten because of my dark thoughts and actions. I am healed because he suffered for me. In the story of Thomas and Jesus, Thomas couldn't believe in the risen Christ Jesus. He couldn't get his head around the idea of resurrection. No one comes back to life from the dead. But then he sees Jesus. And Jesus shows him the scars of love on his hands, his feet and his side. And Thomas falls to the ground and proclaims Jesus as Lord and God. Perhaps I too need to see the scars of love in my mind's eye, in my spirit's inner being. And then I too can proclaim my Lord, my God. Let us pray. Our God who calls to us to believe in the risen Christ Jesus, hear our prayers. You understand our pain, the pain we receive, the pain we give, and the pain we have to live with. You accepted wounding and hurting in order that we could be forgiven, in order that we could forgive others. You accepted beating and mocking so that we could have peace, so that we could be peace to others. You accepted whipping and torture and death to hold us and to heal us so that we in turn may hold and heal a broken world. Amen. Hello and welcome to the final in this series of meditations and reflections that we've been having for Good Friday. We hope that the experience has been fruitful for you as you've reflected on the various themes that have been raised. The theme that we're going to be exploring finally is mocked. Our reading for this reflection is taken from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 27, verses 35 to 44. And when they had crucified him, they divided his clothes among themselves, casting lots. Then they sat down there and kept watch over him. Over his head they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two bandits were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him, saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now, if he wants to. For he said, I am God's son. The bandits who were crucified with him also taunted him in the same way. I wonder if there has ever been a time in your life when you have been mocked. I mean, the definition of being mock is, is making fun of someone in a cruel way, uh, derisive, which means to be expressing contempt or ridicule. 
Children seem to be very good at making fun of each other. And certainly as adults, we enjoy a bit of banter now and again, where we kind of play mock at one another, but there's no real cruel intent behind it. However, in our society presently, we have seen that there has been real ridicule and derision from the media as regards our politicians and sometimes from the politicians as regards the media. But what if the person being mocked is doing something for you if, for example, you might be the mocker? Would you still mock them in the same way? Would your contempt for them be quite so strong? How derisive would you will be willing to go? In our passage, there are three sets of people who mock Jesus. And they mock him while he hangs on the cross. There's the passers-by. There's the chief priests, the scribes and the elders. The two bandits on either side as well. They all mock Jesus with this one thing in common. They insist that Jesus should save himself. So the passers-by, firstly, they allude to this temple. They, they take Jesus' words and they, they jumble them up a bit. He didn't actually say what they said here. And they insist that he get himself off the cross. And the chief priests, they call him the king of Israel, the height, really, of uh, mockery. And they insist that he come off the cross. And they talk about him trusting God and why doesn't God deliver him? And perhaps the thing that's the most cruel about this is that they don't say it to him directly. They talk, it, they talk about it amongst themselves, but just loud enough so that he will be able to hear. And finally, the bandits. Well, we're not told what they actually said, but they are simply described as saying things in the same way, mocking Jesus in the same way. The irony shouldn't be lost on us. Jesus cannot come off the cross because he is dying for them. They ridicule, mock and deride him, telling him to come off. But all the while he hangs there, not for his sake, but for theirs. This is the reason that Jesus cannot save himself. Because he didn't come for himself. He's not the one that needs saving. Also, he knows that he must do this for the sake of the world and finish what his heavenly father has requested of him. Think back to Gethsemane. He prays, Father, may this cup pass from me, yet not what I want, what you want. Here's the rub for us. Do we truly believe that Jesus died for us? Do I truly believe that Jesus died for me? Do you believe that Jesus died for you? Or are we like the mockers, the passers-by, wagging our heads shake in shame? Or are we just like the superior chief priests talking amongst ourselves, just loud enough for Jesus to hear our complete rejection of him? Or are we like the bandits on either side, shouting insults, telling him to save himself? I believe that when we don't believe Jesus died for us, either through disobedience or just sheer unbelief, and believe you me, it happens, you can get believers who are unbelieving, who just don't believe they're good enough for Jesus to have died for them. We're no better than those who mocked him as he hung for them. Do we demand some kind of sign, like they did, so that we might believe him a bit more? Well, the reality is, if Jesus had come off the cross, they probably wouldn't have believed him, well, maybe for a minute, but they didn't believe him when he rose from the dead, did they? And even today, you see people who get healed, or they see the miraculous happening, uh, something that's clearly a sign of God's kingdom breaking through, and they still don't believe, or they have no desire to believe how that happened. Today, we celebrate Jesus crucified for our sin. 
in staying on the cross, he was completing the work for us. If he'd come off, it would have been left unfinished and the world wouldn't have had any way to be at peace with God. We rejoice that Jesus endured this mocking for our sake. But there is just one other way I would like us to think about this. There are times when precisely because of this belief that we have in Christ, we too can be mocked, ridiculed and derided. We can take encouragement from Jesus staying on the cross, that if he endured it all, then so too can we. And this isn't because we're some special person that God particularly likes, but because what we believe is true. We all know that Jesus endured this for our sake. We've all been touched by his saving power and we've been rescued from our own sin and disobedience. Let's spend a few moments as we contemplate these things. We'll have some questions interspersed with silence to help you reflect. If the questions are helpful, use them. If they're not, just don't listen to them and allow the Lord to speak to you as you meditate. Have you ever been mocked, ridiculed, or taken part in deriding someone in your life? What happened? What impact did it have on you and the other person? How does the irony strike you that those deriding Jesus tell him to come down to save himself but the very reason he is there is to save them? How firm is your faith in all Jesus was when he went to the cross? Do you fully believe that he died for you? Or are there niggling doubts about how effective his sacrifice is in your life?
Bring those doubts to God now in prayer. Ask for a greater resolve to know Jesus crucified for you, to deliver you from your sin and shame. Have there been times when you've been ridiculed for your faith? How did it feel? Do you find it difficult to maintain your belief in Christ when you are derided and ridiculed? What can you ask of God to help you remain strong in your faith? Speak to God now as a child to a parent, giving him all those things people have said over you. Ask him to take them from your mind and replace them with the truth of what God thinks about you. is 
treasure How great the pain of searing loss The Father turns His face away As wounds which mar the chosen one To bring many sons to glory The man upon a cross My sin upon his shoulders Ashamed I hear my mocking voice Call out among the scoffers It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished His dying breath has brought me life I know that it is finished I will not boast in anything no gifts no power no wisdom but I will boast on Jesus Christ his death and resurrection why should I gain from his reward I can I know with all my heart His wounds have paid my ransom Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for all the benefits you have won for us, for all the pains and insults you have borne for us. Most merciful Redeemer, friend and brother, may we know you more clearly, love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly, day by day. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. We pray that you have come to a greater awareness of Jesus and all that he has done in and through and for us. And so we close now with a blessing. Christ crucified draw you to himself to find in him a sure ground for faith, a firm support for hope, and the assurance of sins forgiven. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you now and always. Amen. <laughs>